There's a lot of change at the moment, but there are two monster trends changing everything. Um, one is that cloud is becoming real, and the second is that solid state storage is displacing spinning disks. And both of those have profound um, repercussions across the industry. The most dis disruptive uh, trend that's recently happened was the advent of flash technology. So that's really um, changed uh, the entire dynamics on how we do storage. The new data center could be quite a bit different than what we're used to today. The traditional local storage in a corporate data center is likely to decline. But there are a significant number of companies that are still building data centers, that are still populating them with perhaps their own storage systems that they build from commodity components. With any new, um, new technology, a new horizon, there's uh, a lot of people saying what's going to happen next. You need to understand, is this something I need to worry about right away? Or is this something that's going to take a while to be adopted? Non-volatile memory is the next progression in storage. NVMe, I want to learn a bunch more about that. That's where we're headed next. What we're working on now is likely to be an interim step towards that next change that we'll need to address and fairly quickly. There are a number of new technologies emerging uh, that go beyond the current capabilities of Flash, but they require some changes in the way applications and other types of software manipulate those technologies. I see software becoming uh, a, a solution um, that the enterprises continue with and then the broader market in general is, is still um, enamored with appliances. And so I, I, I see both um, the appliances still marching ahead the way they've been and then the, the enterprise uh, focusing on software. All this is leading to huge amount of change, not just at the storage vendor perspective, but also at the end of the customers on how they're looking managing and implementing storage looking forward. There is a, a, a lot of overlap for a lot of these technologies. When it comes to the, the latest technologies, including solid state drives or non-volatile memory or non-volatile memory express, the NVMe stuff that's coming down the road, or fiber channel with the advances, they all intersect. You can do NVMe with fiber channel. We can do Rocky with Ethernet and iWarp with, you know, uh, with these types of, of technologies. Putting this all together into a meaningful uh, fashion is very important. How can we bring all of these together to produce the next generation of storage management API? There are, there are few places that you can go um, in the industry and get um, peer-reviewed, vendor-neutral information about new technologies. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to welcome to SNEA's 20th Storage Developer Conference. We're excited to have you here today, not just those in the room, but also those who unfortunately couldn't make it in person today and are watching us live on streamed right now on YouTube. Quick uh, bit of housekeeping before we jump into today's sessions. Wanted to just remind everyone, I, I, I know many of you have been involved with SNEA for the last 20 years, but some of you are new. So just want to take a quick recap on what is SNEA about? If you were going to go click on about, what would, what would summarize SNEA? Standards, those you're most familiar with. We'll, we'll, we'll go into some more details in a later presentation what some of those standards are. Plugfests and our conformance test programs. Again, you're seeing just here at the event this week, we have three different plug fests that are going on. We'll, we'll cover a bit of, on those as well. Technology initiatives as well. When we have new, new initiatives that come to the marketplace, companies have come together to promote, provide education in, in the form of the initiative output and also the formal SNEA education programs that we have along with certification programs as well that have been longstanding in the marketplace now that are vendor neutral and uh, available for those that are just starting in their careers in the storage industry and those looking to take some of the advanced level certifications as well. And of course, the SNEA event, you are at one today. 
and hope to see you at other ones throughout the year, both in person and as we've adapted with the industry and travel considerations for many of you. We do a tremendous amount of webcasts, Bright Talk and other platforms that we stream. Please, if you haven't joined yet to the uh, distribution list, if you haven't subscribed to, uh, to SNEA, if you're not receiving SNEA Matters, we'll fix that this week. A big thank you to all of you who are here as attendees, to all the speakers and all the sponsors. It's great to see the continued commitment of the storage industry vendors in working together and bringing these type of events to, to you, bringing us together so we can talk about not just the challenges of today, but what we need to be doing together tomorrow. In terms of schedule for today, general sessions, which we'll be starting briefly here, will be in this room through noon. In terms of lunch, we'll be out on the mezzanine. Please do get a chance to circle around, talk to our sponsors that are in the mezzanine area. Then the breakout sessions will commence at 1 o'clock through 5 p.m., at which time we'll have a networking reception. Again, an opportunity to talk with our sponsors, learn about their product and services. Many of them are showing, for the first time, new demos and solutions that were intended to be shown at Flash Memory Summit, and they're getting a first chance to show them publicly here at SDC. So we're excited to have those, showing those technologies here at SDC this week. And last but not least, please do join us for the Birds of a Feather sessions. These are sessions which are, are the early conversations of new standards, new technologies, new considerations that we as an industry have to tackle. Many of our projects start in that form, and we started last night with two Birds of a Feather session, very well attended, great excitement and energy there. Look forward to continuing that this, the rest of this week. So please look for those and please do join. And as a bonus for those present, they tend to at least provide some, some beer, so enjoy that after hours. Uh, if you haven't downloaded the Storage Developer Conference app, please take your phone out, not just to put it on mute for the sessions, but actually to download the app. <laughs> You're able to um, scan the, uh, the QR code here. It's available in front of the registration desk. And of course, you can also do it from the link that you've been sent with your registration for the event. And if you go on to the app stores, please search by the full name Storage Developer Conference, and the app should pop up there. Be able to follow, create a customized schedule for yourself throughout this. Make sure you don't miss anything. One of the changes you should have seen in our conference this year, we've actually gone full day on Thursday in order to try to minimize the amount of overlap in sessions and give you an opportunity as much as possible to attend all the different sessions that you have an interest in. You'll also be able to see more information on the speakers. And one of the cool features as well, be able to see those people selecting their itinerary, who is actually attending sessions. If you're looking to network, find someone, it's a great app for that perspective as well. So please make use of it. Please give us your feedback on it so we can improve and make sure it's the best tool maximizing the time that you are spending here with us this week. Tweeting, please, we're encouraging you to Tweet about SDC this week. Please use the, the hashtag, SDC, hashtag SDC17. Throughout the week, we are monitoring those, promoting them as well. And so there is going to be an award, Intel SSD drive. And if you guys really contribute highly on this, I'm sure we can work on trying to get you an Optane drive next year. So. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I mentioned uh, the uh, plug fest that uh, we have going on this week. A big thank you to the underwriters and participants of the long-standing partnership with Microsoft and NetApp, who are underwriting this plug fest. Uh, you can see the list of companies that uh, the impressive list of companies that are listed here that are downstairs plugging away at the uh, SMB3. Also, the um, cloud, interoper cloud Interoperability Plug Fest is happening this week as well. A big thank you to the Cloud Storage Initiative Group for sponsoring that. 
and driving those activities forward. Last but not least, the SMI Lab is uh, the other underwriter for the PlugFest this week. A lot of great work, not just on a very successful SNES spec with tremendous implementations, number of implementations in the industry on the SMIS spec, but also a new up and coming spec in the space with RESTful APIs and all sorts of exciting collaboration opportunities with the DMTF on the Redfish spec. We are, of course, doing the Swordfish spec, and we're starting to see the first of those implementations and PluckFest activities around it. Quick recap on the general session speakers for today. I'll be providing a quick overview on what SNEA does, take a retrospective on the last 20 years since we're celebrating that milestone this year, and through that experience, trying to draw a line out on the possibilities and where we're headed for the next 20 years. 9.45, um, Memories of Tomorrow, Tom Coughlin and Jim Handy will be, will be following. Quick break after that, to just to like, grab some coffee and buy a break as needed. Um, we'll be, um, Sage will be up on stage uh, on the um, Goodbye to XFS speech, and um, followed by that, uh, Martin will be up here on recent development in the Linux I.O. stack. Please attend those sessions. Again, birds of a feather sessions for today. I mentioned that uh, those are starting at seven o'clock today. Mark Carlson is will be hosting the first one on data center storage update and futures, and followed by Eden Kim on understanding real work workloads today. At, at I actually apologize; those are running in parallel today, so you'll have to choose between them uh, and your interest, uh, as opposed to last night we actually ran them in series. Evaluations. We are here as an organization for you, the members and the attendees of this event. Please give us your feedback. Not only it's an easy 100 bucks, you'll have a much better chance of winning 100 bucks than you will the California lottery. But highly encourage you guys to participate. Give us your feedback. We need to know not just what we're doing poorly, yes, we always want the feedback on what we can improve, but we love to hear from you on what we're doing well so we can continue doing that for the next events. So with that, we'll wish you a great event. Many of you are here the second day for the event and look forward to interacting with you, not just in the sessions, the uh, tremendous, tremendous agenda that's been pre prepared by the agenda team. And we're very excited to have you here. And I'll jump into the first presentation. So as we look, as we try to look at the future, I found it best to, and necessary, to look at our past, look at our history, understand where did we come from, what were some of the learnings, what were some of the milestones, what trajectory are we on? No one can predict the future, especially in technology 20 years out. I'll, I'll, I'll be clear about that, and I'm not trying to stand up here and tell you that I know what's gonna happen 20 years out. But with the experience of the last 20 years in the, in, in the storage industry, we can start looking at those trajectories and what is possible. And some of that is driven by the choices, the very choices that we, we in this room, the companies that we work for and represent, make every day on our new, project, new projects, new technologies, new standards, how we drive them. Are we doing collaboratively? Are we doing open? Are, are we truly working together as an industry for the benefit of our end users. So, how do we get here? Well, it really started about 40,000 years ago. <laughs> as uh, many of you know, you know, we have carbon dated cave paintings that have been found dating all the way back to 40,000 40, 40, years ago. Those driven by human nature. 
socializing, seeking shelter, being together, spending time indoors, and trying to depict how we lived our lives. These are followed by pictograms by 9,000 years ago. Those as, uh, cities and larger, larger groups of people were living together, they found the need for being able to identify produce, constructions, buildings, and they would do those through pictograms. Then 5,000 years ago came writing. And interestingly enough, as the population of the world had increased on all of the continents, this one, if you look at the history, is kind of claimed by, you could see where parallel invention of writing really happened on three different and distinct civilizations from the Sumerians and Egyptians about the same time frame and somewhat in the same area to China to the, uh, the, what, what then became the Mayan culture and, and, and empire. Overall, what did that drive us to? It still wasn't until about 300 years ago that paper itself was used for data storage. What do I mean by that? Because the first implementation of this was really used for some of the, the, the yarns in France to be able to actually automate things. It wasn't actually storing data, it was storing a set of instructions, essentially. It was about another 150 years later until we actually did have data storage, where we did the punch cards, data cards, where we actually stored information that machines could then read. And then subsequently, the next big milestone in how we got here is commercial electricity. All of our electronics run on electricity. Without this one, we would be not streaming on YouTube today. So from there on, what, what happened? Well, about 70 years ago, actually this year, it'll be 70 years, transistor happened. Hard disk, 63 years ago. Network storage, 34, 33 years ago, depending which, which one you kind of look at from the Novell or Sun perspective. Flash memory, Toshiba brought that officially to market 33 years ago. Storage area networks, 23 years ago. Okay, maybe I'll say 21 was 1996 when one gigabit fiber channel really kind of took off and hit the marketplace and then continued doubling its speed every few years since to, to date. And then SNEA happened. The organization overall formed very, very shortly after some of the very first fiber channel devices came out, recognizing that this is new for the industry. There was a need for education. The companies that were bringing these technologies to market came together to provide that platform of education to the marketplace, collaboration on training, and the standards that were needed for conformance, interoperability of those products, and many, many, many more things that SNEA has done since. So, let's talk briefly on why standards are important. I'm gonna pick on one of those things from that list of the previous pages of what we come around, and use electricity as an example on why standards are important. Well, first, this started in, uh, with, with, with a big battle, a uh, battle of the currents, if, if, you, would, if you would, and um, between AC and DC currents in the late 1800s. Well, two driving forces between Edison and Westinghouse, they're essentially both had their own ideas, they saw their own benefits of direct current versus alternating current, and well, eventually, on that one, AC won out. Why, primarily? Without getting into the politics and the fun uh, back and forth of, those, of that time frame, was essentially distribution. How do you efficiently distribute electricity over long distances and then be able to bring it, not just for outdoor applications, which was some of the first 
uh, first implementation of electricity for, but also for indoor use in homes, and of course, in the industry. So, a little bit of the history of what happened there. We ended up with two different set of voltage ranges that occurred. We kind of standardized on overall. One, you'll find it throughout Europe dominantly and the countries that were connected and did business historically with Europe and the other in the US and the rest of the world that mostly dealt and bought products from the US. Well, on the frequency side, it's a little bit of a more complicated and worse story because at the very beginning, there were up to 14 different frequencies that were implemented in this, and there wasn't a standard around this. Well, eventually that settled down to about two principal ones, of uh, uh, 50 and 60 hertz, but even some of the less popular ones uh, from a generic application perspective, like the 25 hertz, those were alive and well and still had commercial production all the way up until 2009, if you believe it or not. So out of those, even you think, OK, that kind of came down, came together. Great, it was a big mess at the beginning, but we've got four. Four, four permutations, essentially, that we have to live with today in the global marketplace. Well, I have to throw in one more mix in there, the fact that there's 15 different plugs, depending where you are in the world, for connecting to that power outlet. So what's the impact, right? We started essentially with big innovation, big change. I mean, again, the whole high-tech sector essentially would not exist without electricity. So it's fundamental innovation that was brought that was brought to us in the, in the late 1800s, in the 19th century. But what was the impact of the fact that there was no standardization up front? Well, if you look at just cities, for example, in the early 1900s, like London, they had up to 10 different frequencies in, in there. And we'll talk a little bit about in, in a moment why that's important and the, the, the impact that it has on not just not allowing things to work, but in many cases, not working the way they're supposed to. So the electronics industry today, all of us travel with our laptops, cell phones, everything else. We're like, hey, we don't really see what the big deal is of not having had standards here because, well, the electronics operate on DC power. So the joy of the manufacturers has been to provide power supplies that can adapt to all of these different permutations and provide us that freedom of just find one of those 15 plugs that I have to figure out how to get into the power outlet. That's simple enough, right? But even today, the electric machinery and motors that are out there in operation are a different story because they don't operate on DC. There isn't a conversion sitting in front of them. So they very much have to be designed for the respective voltage and frequency. Well, that results in higher costs for people, right? Not just for the manufacturers who initially, if you look at the history, right, started to protect their marketplace between the uh, the companies in Europe and Germany that were the predominant manufacturers and suppliers of electric appliances back in the early days, and Westinghouse Electric in the, in the US. But now, for those machines, you still, to the state, have to keep different SKUs that conform to the respective voltage and frequencies. That's a higher cost for manufacturers. Managing your inventory is that much more challenging when you have a proliferation of SKUs. From a consumer perspective, choice is a challenge. If you're moving, you have to kind of consider what you're willing and what you're not willing to take with you, of course. Much, much less likely to be taking your washing machine from the US to Europe, but in the areas where 
throughout the world, they are kind of neighboring countries that do have different frequencies or voltages. And for the ladies out there in the audience, your favorite hair dryer, well, you're buying a new one at that point because it's, it's not gonna function properly. But you say, okay, but we've, we've kind of somewhat managed, so like, why are really standards that important? Well, let's look a little bit deeper for an example. LA Power Grid is an example. In the early 1900s, when the power grid was set up for LA, the, there was no standardization. There was standardization on voltage in the US or general agreement, but there was no standardization on the frequency. So the LA power grid was set up on 50 hertz instead of 60. You say, okay, well, it's close enough. Why, why, why the big deal? Well, all the way up until 1945, LA was operating on this different power grid. And again, you say, well, okay, fine, whatever. What's the big deal? Well. If you moved from New York to LA and you brought your clock with you and you plugged it into the wall in, in your brand new home in LA, you would be consistently off base about 10 minutes every hour, in fact. Not to mention your lighting fixture and others, other things would be problematic. So, okay, fine, you buy new ones. You kind of have to go deal with it. But Easier example of you love to listen to music. You were in San Francisco, move down to LA, bring down your record player, start pull, plug it in, all of a sudden you're getting a very nice and deep voice coming out of your player. Well, it's spinning at, at a reduced rate because of that frequency. So the power grid company in LA eventually had to make the change and standardize to, to 60 hertz. That process took him three years. During that time frame, it cost them more than $30 million in, in, back in 1940s. That was a lot of money. In fact, that was a third of their gross, rev gross annual revenue that it cost them to set up exchanges for clocks, lighting fixtures, refrigerators, for three quarter million people in LA, which certainly was a number of people that they started with and were supporting back in the late 1800s. So these are the consequences that we have to consider when we are pursuing implementations around new technologies. And that is why organizations, not just to sneer at the drum are, are, are beat, but in general, companies coming together and discussing and having these considerations up front is important. Otherwise, it will cost you down the line, not to mention the nine phases that the power grid company had to manage in order to make that transition over three years. It's a huge, huge impact in time sync, not just for the company, but for the individuals of that city. So you say, okay, great, but that was, you know, about 50, 60 years later after, and it's been some time. What's the big deal now? Well, it's a quick look at Japan's power grid. Everyone remembers the uh, unfortunate event and tsunami in Japan, which affected millions of people and the power grid in that country. What it brought to attention was the fact that Japan had been operating since the early 1930s when it made its acquisitions of its power generators and set up their power grid, that they were operating on same voltage, different frequency. So the side of Tokyo and east side of Japan essentially was operating on equipment that was purchased from Germany, operating on 50 hertz. The west side, Osaka, set up their grid, was set up on US 
GE purchased equipment, which was 60 hertz. Great, operated, no issues, considerations. They were able to manage that, just peachy for the most part, until this event occurred. And they operated that way for 80 or so years. The impact of that was when they were, they were forced to essentially, they were, by the event, the power production on the east side of Japan and to Tokyo specifically was severely, severely impacted. This reduced their ability to operate data centers in Tokyo, having to move capacities for their operations to the west side of Japan, to Korea, to US, and other parts of the world. Rolling blackouts throughout the city and the area that were have to be managed because of this huge shortfall of power. But kind of the insult to the injury here, if, if you'll allow me, is the fact that the west side of Japan had the capacity, production-wise, to actually supply near peak demand what the east side of Japan, Tokyo, and the rest of the east side of Japan needed. But when you have this type of incompatibility, this invisible line that divided Japan from a power grid perspective, it caused a huge, huge issue. It takes normally 18 to 24 months to be able to spin up and bring up new power capacity to a country. This was non-trivial. And the fact that you had it right there and not being able to use it because of this was, again, a reminder why a little more discussion and standardization up front in the early years would have helped to avoid some of the additional and unnecessary problems that this caused. Of course, you say, well, you can convert those things. Yes, there are ways of converting between the two, but whenever you have to do conversions, you're losing power. You have to go through what we would think of as an API or a converter, right? So you can convert the AC from one side into DC current and then from DC back into AC at the right frequency. But capacity for that is, was extremely limited in Japan. The cost for bringing something like that up was highly inefficient and it takes time to be able to do that. So once again, facing a situation that could have been avoided with forethought planning. And I bring these up to, for, for us to think, again, all of the technologies that we work in the electronics industry, based on power, is a fundamental enabler. And in many cases, we still haven't learned some of the mishaps over the last 100 years of not standardizing on, on power. So, let's take another perspective on the last 20 years and how far we've come. These are name brands, companies, devices that we are all familiar with. They're part of our life. They're in your pockets. They're on the desk. They're at home. They are everywhere. How many of these companies were around in 20 years ago? Well, it started five. Pokemon Go, Apple Watch, Microsoft Surface, Amazon Echo, not around. 10 years, well, no iPhone, no Waze, no Lyft or Uber. 15 years ago, Sorry, no Facebook. Those photos that you're hoping someone 40,000 years from now will be able to see them, just like those cave paintings. Sorry, you better have them stored somewhere, somewhere else. 20 years ago, big names. No Google, no DVR, USB, things that I'm sure everyone's got at least one, if not two, USB drives in their pockets and other devices. Netflix. Blackberry, Alibaba, so many others that on there did not exist 20 years ago. Why did I choose to kind of take this look at, at these brand names just 
again, to solidify in our minds just how much we've achieved in the last 20 years. But part of the reason I did, which of these are data center dependent? That without data center technologies, which SNEA and the respective companies in this room have enabled, how many of them would not exist without data centers and the fundamental technologies that are in place there and that we're continuing to invest presently? They're highlighted in blue there. It's an interesting perspective to understand the fundamental impact that we, as developers, have on everyday life in the world. And if we are to look ahead, I am willing to bet that some of these companies on this list will not be on this list 20 years from now because other new innovators that are taking advantage of the technologies that you are working on standardizing and developing today, they're adopting and they're gonna outpace the current leaders. So, a little bit about SNEA and what we do. Flash is on the top of everyone's list. Everyone is flashing left and right in every which direction nowadays with new media, new interfaces. It's definitely hit the mainstreams in terms of workload and it is the innovation focus for the industry. Persistent memory, well, we've talked about that and how it is going to fundamentally change the computer architecture model that we're familiar today and how software is written and interacts with some of those systems. And again, I mentioned earlier, those that will innovate, they'll be able to bring out new products, new services to market based on these capabilities and innovation that we haven't seen yet. There are not just startups in the storage industry, but it will be new startups that we will see over the next 20 years that take advantage of this technology. They'll bring to market things that we haven't even thought about yet. Of course, doing this, uh, the emphasis on doing, developing responsibly what we do on, on the green front. Uh, SNEA has, uh, has been doing great work on that with, uh, in the US with EPA and around the world with uh, the work on Energy Star program, but the Emerald program that SNEA has, um, is, is leading and has uh, brought to market as a standard. On the security front, while there is specifically a security twig, at SNEA we take an approach to looking at anything that we bring to market, what is the security consideration for it? Persistent memory, for example. We're, we're looking at that, what are the security considerations that we have to take into account? It's different than storage today. We have to look at, we can't apply the same security principles and assume they work in persistent memory applications and implementations. Object drives, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, that in some upcoming foils and uh, some of the companies that have joined and contributed to, to SNEA and ter as well on, on cloud um, are standards that exist in there um, while have, uh, have seen great traction in Europe in particular where the EU government is making some mandates and looking at where they would like to see cloud go and what standards, wherever standards exist, they are essentially looking to dictate and bring those in in order to ensure interoperability of services to the government and to the rest of the companies in Europe. On the management front, I already mentioned the SMIS and the new Swordfish uh, standard that is now uh, been the published and of course working on the next rev already, constantly innovating and looking at what the industry needs moving forward. In terms of members, we have about 160 companies around the world, 2,500 active people in SNEA contributing in some form or fa fa 
<clears throat> in some, excuse me, <clears throat> somewhere around the world in some form or another. And we also have 50,000 people that are subscribed to our newsletter and interact and consume our content that is, is published, webcast, emails, news specs, everything else that is, um, is publicized and shared by SNEA. <clears throat> so in terms of the last 20 years of standards development, well, we've taken many of these SNEA specs and haven't, haven't become ISO and ANSI standards. Some of them have remained as storage standards that are adopted and implemented by companies as are best practices in security. And well, you're wondering, well, what are some of those standards? It's a long list. We would be here for quite some time if I were to take the opportunity to walk you through each and every one of those. But each and every one of them has a life cycle. It comes, it gets adopted, implemented. Some of them are continuing mainstream spec and standards today. Some of them have been retired, and there will be constantly new ones that we are working on. That is the industry we live in. For those of you that are not familiar, in uh, July of last year, a, another standard, another group in the industry who was driving standard joined SNEA as a new membership category that we created last year, Technology Affiliate. This enables other groups to essentially come and operate under SNEA, have the benefit of the organizational structure that we have, the IP policy that we have that is well reviewed and has been beat up from a lot of different angles by a lot of different companies. And just in the last year plus that they've been under SNEA, nine new specs that they have implemented and rolled out in the industry. So, say so that sounds great, but it sounds, I'm not sure how, how do I make things to be a standard? How, I see the list, you'll see the list on what we're working on, but I, I have this idea, how do I, how do I get engaged? As I mentioned earlier, we are here for you. If you have a new idea, new direction, new technology that you think is important to the industry, all it requires you are a SNEA member, find two friends in different companies, and a provisional toy can be approved where resources can be applied and start getting your message out as to what are your thoughts, start formulating a plan and see if how you get other people in the industry to join you, start developing that standard, and then we have the whole process and infrastructure in place on how those are driven into ISO or other standards as necessary and appropriate. Contact information there if you need help. You're not alone. We're, we're here to help, help you through that. In terms of specifications, we're currently act and actively working on quite a few different specifications. On CloudFront, CDMI is the, the cloud, <clears throat> cloud management data interface, IP-based drive management, key value APIs, LTFS. I know a long time ago people said tape would be dead, drives would be dead. Well. Media industry and others, even for cloud onboarding today, are utilizing LTFS-based um, solutions to move large sets of data in between physical locations. The NVM programming model I've already mentioned and the impact that is having on system architecture and how we think about things. As storage developers, we have to understand that our brothers and sisters that do software development don't always think of 
what is the impact of new technology coming in the marketplace? And this is a very fundamental impact. I won't go into the details because there have been and there are several sessions that go into what we're doing there, why it's important, and the fact that new work is happening on persistent memory over fabrics, which is how do you get outside the box. <clears throat> SURF is another one of the standards. The SNE Emerald program I've mentioned. Um, there are performance tests and specifications for that that are under the SSSI group. The SMI and Swordfish, those I've already mentioned, all active projects within SNEA presently. The SFF groups I mentioned, they're working on connectors, transceivers, form factors. They presently have 17 different projects that are active today. So please look on the website. We have various vehicles where those projects are announced and communicated to SNEA members and non. In terms of uh, open source, not too many people, but I'm hoping after this presentation and as we continue to get the message out, SNEA is involved in open source software. And we have several active projects there. And as listed, the API emulator for Swordfish. Um, on the Swordfish side, we've uh, done three different uh, reference implementations to be able to test our implementation of the spec and help accelerate the development of the next rev of the specifications and help companies to implement these new, this new technology, the spec and their new technology and offerings. CDMI reference implementation is also one that is part of the open source software. And just to bring out, we enabled last year a methodology by which you do not have to be a SNEA member to participate in our open source projects. Essentially, it's a contributor license agreement that as a non-member you would sign, which ensures that your contributions are properly handled and making sure that it doesn't cause problem for the spec later down the line in terms of IP and other considerations. But so we have that mechanism in place. In um, this case, we actually had a company, Indigo Data Cloud, that took that reference implementation, implemented, essentially took it out as a fork, implemented additional feature sets that they had an interest in. But then they took that back and contributed back to SNEA, enriching the feature set that is now available for everyone else to build on and evolve that spec. Another success story on CDMI is uh, Philips Research. So Philips was facing a problem in the medical in their medical services side. And they looked to CDMI as a solution. They embraced that solution, brought, joined as a member. They're an active member of, of the spec. And that's the beauty of not just consuming the specs after they've been published, but actually joining as an active member of the community then you're not faced with having to eat what was cooked. You actually get to play in the kitchen, provide your own ingredients, and preferred method. So encourage you to, to become active, because that is how you're going to get what you want in a faster way, and then ensure that your products will be interoperable with your fellow teammates in the storage industry. Other projects, um, we do have um, a repository for IO traces, tools, and, analysis, um, <clears throat> and um, analysis. Those are heavily utilized by students and um, the, the education community. Um, 
DPCO has is looking at a hundred year archive in the middle of a assessment or survey there to help enrich and provide the, the direction and output of that group. And if you attended one of the Birds of a Feather session last night on workloads, a provisional twig that had been assessed, again, as I mentioned earlier, we talk about what we're gonna do. We don't hide it. We invite you to participate because that is how we, get, how we successfully move things forward together. We also publish our, our draft specs. This is the current list, URLs at the top. Encourage you to go take a look at our draft specs. Realize that some of you aren't members, but the importance of doing this is, did we miss something? What is the impact? Are you working on something that's relevant to this that should make you join either to adopt the technology or standardize it or bring a new, new work into the work group to further advance their respective specs and technologies. So please check them out, please provide feedback and get involved. So that's what we're doing. Where are we going? What are we facing? We're literally facing an avalanche of information that is coming at us, both as developers, as consumers, as individuals. And there's a lot of things that are contributing to this avalanche of information that, that we're facing, right? From Morse laws, continuing to provide higher performance, drive costs lower, drive power lower. That's more precipitation just building up for, for this avalanche of information. IoT. Every little new gadget and device out there is generating, gathering data that has to be stored, analyzed, monetized in some form or another. And you think those devices are many right now? Well, 5G is gonna ex make that explode to the next level because that will connect a lower power, higher bandwidth, a bunch of devices that we haven't even thought of today. VR and AR, if you look at the raw bandwidth or data that some of these solutions require, we're talking upwards of 23 gigabytes per frame for some of these immersive capabilities that people are thinking of and piloting right now. Smart cities, AI, all these things that are generating more and more data that has to be stored, analyzed, and sorted. Well, just some, some more examples to kind of put that into, some, in, into perspective and numbers for you. In February of this year, statistically, there are 500 hours of video uploaded every minute into the social media feeds. If you look at our defense department capabilities, just looking at our, our drones, those are capable of capturing 430 petabytes of data per day. We talked about IoT, 5G, what that's gonna bring. Well, predicted over 20 billion connected devices by 2020. We're three years away from that. And if you're looking at the survey, the um, surveillance markets in terms of video capture there, another two plus exabyte of data per day that is being generated. I think we're in the right marketplace for storage. We have some challenges ahead of us, but the good news is there's high demand for it and for what we are doing because trying to manage the amount of data that is being generated using yesterday's technology or mentality is just not possible. It is not sustainable, but whether you embrace and accept that or not, that data and that avalanche, it is still coming straight at you. 
So with that, I, um, in terms of what's next, there's lots of things that, that are next. And I put a few other things on here, and I'd love to talk, hear feedback from you in the hallways in between sessions, at the sessions, email, join as a member, call us up, send us an email, grab us any which way possible through social media and interact with us and give us your thoughts and feedback. But the list of challenges that we face our next year, next year, next five years, 10, 20, are enormous. And the only way we're going to successfully overcome those is by working together and collaborating with one another as opposed to not doing that because as you saw in the example that I gave on the fundamental and just electricity alone, the potential pain later down the line of not doing the right things up front is severe. So please join us. We um, also recognize that many of the companies that have uh, been part members of SNEA for 20 years or such, well, many of them are bigger companies than they used to be. They've grown, been successful, as SNEA itself has been successful in the marketplace. But there's new startups, there's new technologies. We want to make sure that there wasn't an entry to barrier for those startups to participate and be active members of this community. So we create a new membership category for startups. Essentially, if you've been around for less than four years as a company, you can join SNEA for up to four years until you yourself are successful and cross that 10 million annual revenue mark. So. If you're in the audience, if you're watching on YouTube and you're a startup and have any touch point on storage, please join us. This $1,000 is the annual membership fee. It gives you benefit for uh, attending our events, sponsorship to get visibility through all the mechanism that SNEA has, and more importantly, gives you an avenue for that technical learning and interaction with your peers in the industry before specs are rolled out in the marketplace. So last but not least, I want to make sure that you've all seen on the calendar for Wednesday night. Please join us. We have great celebration planned for 20 years of hard work that all of you have been doing. And we are proud and humbled to be here to serve you. Again, please always give us your feedback, bring us your ideas, and let us know how we can better serve you as members of this organization and how we can drive forward the innovation in the storage industry. Thank you. Hope you have a great rest of the day and look forward to your participation and feedback.